We are going to take a look at three different sensory modalities today, touch, taste, and smell. Although sensation happens in the peripheral nervous system, actually it's a good idea to begin the conversation in the central nervous system. Remember the central nervous system is comprised of the brain and the spinal cord, drawn here, and the brain is where we actually perceive sensations. So the perception of sensations happens centrally in these structures of the body that are comprised 99% of interneurons where decisions can be made. Perception is where we take stimuli from the external environment and we actually interpret those stimuli. We can make a decision about, for example, pulling our hand away from a hot stove because we are able to sense the pain and then make a decision in the central nervous system about the action that must be taken. We're gonna be discussing three different sensations, so we're gonna be discussing three different places where those sensations will be communicated to the brain. For first, we have cranial nerve one, which is the olfactory bulb. Olfaction pertains to smell, so that is where information about smell is going to be first coming into the brain. Here we have the medulla oblongata, which is the inferior most part of the brainstem, and the medulla is the structure that receives information about taste first off, and then it's distributed to other places in the brain. And then lastly, we have the spinal cord. Generally speaking, when we touch something, that information is communicated to the spinal cord. So these are the structures of the central nervous system that are involved in perception. Now sensation, is going to be occurring in the peripheral nervous system and sensation and awareness of stimuli changes in the internal and external environment. Remember, perception, which happens in the brain, is where we interpret the stimuli, but we have to have an awareness of those stimuli first and that happens in the peripheral nervous system. So to list out the sensory modalities, we start off with the simplest of them, which is mechanosensation, basically touch, pressure, it's usually thought to be happening at the level of the skin. Then we have chemo sensation, which is where we have some sort of a chemical binding to a receptor and causing changes in the sensory neuron. Photoreception refers to photons of light that interact with a cell, a photoreceptor, and then cause changes within those cells. No susception is specific to pain. So there are some neurons that are set up simply to understand that there is um, damage happening to structures within the body and therefore that needs to be communicated in the form of pain. Thermoreception is an interesting one. We actually don't know a lot about the thermoreceptors, although of course they're very interesting. We have cold thermoreceptors and we have warm thermoreceptors. Additionally, I actually add to this list and say that proprioception is sort of like um, a, a sixth way that we uh, have a sensory modality, um, a, a sixth way that we perceive what's going on. Technically, proprioceptors would be considered mechanoreceptors. That would be the closest cousin. But um, in reality, no so um, th uh, proprioceptors are meant to have an understanding of where you are in space. So, for example, if you have some neurons that are set up in the joints of your body so that you can tell exactly where your elbow is, um, how much it is bent, how much your arm is flexed, then you'll kind of have an understanding of where your arm is in space without even looking down at it. You know where your arm is at all times, and therefore you kind of have an idea of how much you have to move in order to, for example, open a door, or grab a bottle of water, or something like that. So the proprioception is an understanding of where you are in space. It's an interesting and I think poorly understood uh, <laughs> sensation. And technically, this is not a, a specific type of sensory modality, but it is a kind of a separate enough idea that I think it bears its own little definition there. The first specific sense we're gonna be taking a look at is somatosensation, um, basically touch. The next sensation we're gonna be taking a look at is the gustatory system where we experience taste. We have an awareness of taste. And lastly, we have the olfactory system. The olfactory uh, refers to smells, being able to have a sensation of smell. 
Let us begin by discussing the somatosensory sensations. This would include such things as mechanosensation or a sensation of touch or pressure. As part of somatosensation, we would also consider things like nociception and proprioception, an experience of pain and an experience of where you are in space. All of these would con contribute to somatosensory sensations. And there's there's a number of different types of somatosensory neurons, but we're going to basically discuss two different categories. The first one we're going to discuss is an unencapsulated neuron. Unencapsulated neurons are free nerve endings. They tend to be quite sensitive, so the, oftentimes these are going to be nociceptors. Um, the good, in, good examples of unencapsulated uh, neurons would be found, for example, wrapped around the roots of hairs. Your hairs tend to be very sensitive. Um, and also these are associated with tactile cells in the epidermis, very sensitive structures. On the other hand, we have encapsulated neurons. As you can see, the encapsulated neurons are surrounded by layer upon layer of connective tissue. And this simply gives cushioning to the structure and allows for less sensitivity. Examples of encapsulated neurons are things like the Golgi tendon organs, Ruffini's corpuscles, uh, lamellated corpuscles, most of the named structures that you think of with uh, sensory neurons are probably going to be encapsulated. And you notice, of course, that that cell body is all the way back very close to the spinal cord for protection. You can't have the, you can't have the cell body all the way out toward the surface of the skin. It might get damaged. So we put it all the way back in the dorsal root ganglion adjacent to the spinal cord. Then, of course, these neurons are sending their signals through spinal nerves in order to reach the spinal cord. Ooh, let's move on to the gustatory system. So when we discuss the gustatory system, we are discussing chemicals called tastants, which are basically particles from the food that you're eating, tastants that must be dissolved in saliva in order for them to be received. And while we're at it, let's go ahead and discuss the olfactory system in a similar way. When we smell things, we have chemicals called odorants, which are particles of the things that you're smelling, and these must be dissolved in mucus. So tastants are dissolved in saliva, odorants are dissolved in a mucus, otherwise they would never be able to be sensed properly. So when you have a condition where you may not be producing enough saliva, for example, or you might not be producing enough mucus for whatever reason, your sense of taste or your sense of smell are going to be affected. Since technically tastants and odorants are chemicals, these sensations, the sensory modality here is chemosensory. You have a chemical, a tastant or an odorant binding to a receptor, and that is how these things are sensed in the first place. Chemosensory. So let's get into some details about the anatomy, the structures of how tastants are sensed. So we start off with a simple diagram of the tongue, and you notice, of course, on your tongue you have lots of dots. Oftentimes these are erroneously referred to as taste buds, but in fact they are papillae. Let's take a closer look at the papillae. Remember that the term papilla means nipple-like projection. So we're gonna have a structure that kind of sticks out. And in this case, we're gonna have little caves, little caverns in the sides of this papilla. There is going to be an opening which opens to each of them. It's gonna be called a taste pore. So let's label the entire structure of papilla, but let's, further label the structures that we're looking at here as the taste buds. So the taste buds, it turns out, are found on the sides of the papilla. And you notice I'm filling in each of the little caves with parentheses. <laughs> we're going to be blowing one of these up and taking a closer look at it and actually colorizing these, but just so you know, what's contained within here are gustatory hair cells, or gustatory epithelial cells. They are technically epithelial cells, but they're modified to allow us to have an understanding and reception of tastants. So here we go. Tastants are going to be dissolved in saliva and are going to bathe over the tongue and some of those tastants will make their way along the sides of the papillae 
and into these taste pores where they will interact with the taste buds. At the back of the taste buds, if you will, sort of towards the center of the papilla, you'll have some nerve fibers, which are true neurons. The taste buds are made of epithelial cells, but the behind them you actually do have nerve cells, which will carry the signal eventually into the rest of the nervous system. So let's take a look at one of these taste buds. We're going to draw kind of an oval shape here with a hole in the front and a hole in the back. The hole in the front is called a taste pore. This is the hole through which the saliva with the dissolved taste tints will enter into the taste bud in the first place. It's important to realize that there's actually three different types of epithelial cells here. The first ones we're drawing are the cells that are surrounding the taste bud and these are going to be supportive and protective. These epithelial cells are straightforward, stratified squamous epithelium. You'll notice, of course, that the apical cells are more flattened and the cells toward the more basal region are more robust and rounded. Next, we're gonna go ahead and draw sort of long, skinny bananas <laughs> inside of here. And you'll see that they curve around. The ones in the center are going to be a little more straightforward, but for the most part, we picture these um, curving around and uh, basically straddling from front to back, from the taste pore all the way to the back, where the nerve cell will actually meet the structure. I'm sort of differentiating one end of this. The very front and the end of it that's closest to the taste pore, you'll notice I made it a little bit darker in color, kind of like the um, the stem of a banana, if you will. <clears throat> these are called gustatory hairs, and they are actually the sensitive region of these structures. So the entire cell is often called a gustatory hair cell, but oftentimes it's also called a gustatory epithelial cell. Maybe it would be helpful to think about the difference between the gustatory hair region and then the rest of the cell, which is the gustatory epithelial cell. At the back, again, we're going to just draw this in light green. We're going to draw some nerve fibers that are going to be receiving information from these gustatory epithelial cells and are going to be sending it back. Now, this is an interesting system because the, neur the neurons, the sensitive cells that are at the back of the taste bud are actually pretty well protected and less likely to be um, destroyed, for example, if you burn your tongue on hot coffee. Now the signal is going to be sent through cranial nerves uh, straight to the medulla oblongata, cranial nerve 7, which is the facial nerve, and cranial nerve 9, which is the glossopharyngeal nerve. Um, they both, I've kind of drawn it as one, but you understand that these are two separate nerves that both um, bring the information back to the medulla oblongata. The fact that the taste bud is comprised of epithelial cells means that you can actually regenerate them. Most neural cells cannot be regenerated, but most epithelial cells can be. And so we have these basal epithelial cells, which are kind of babies or nascent cells, which can, if needed, grow up to be gustatory epithelial cells. Gustatory epithelial cells regenerate every seven to 10 days. So now what we're gonna do is we're going to colorize a few of the gustatory epithelial cells in order to show that there are different types of gustatory epithelial cells in regards to what they are actually sensitive to. So we'll start off with these gray cells that we're going to color that we're going to label as bitter um, sensitive cells and the taste tints in this case would be structures like alkaloids and quinine. In pink, we're going to go ahead and label cells that are sensitive to sweet, the, the, the sensation of sweetness. And of course, sweetness is going to be in regards to the taste in sugars and also things like saccharin and things like alcohol. These are all taste ins that would represent a sensation of sweet. We'll go ahead and label one of the cells in purple. This will be representing the sensation of sour. You can use whatever colors you like, of course. 
The sensation of sour is represented by the tastants, hydrogen ions, and acids. In blue, we will have salt. Salt is the sensation. The tastant in this case is going to be metal ions, such as sodium ions and potassium ions, for example. And lastly, in brown, we'll do one gustatory epithelial cell, which we're going to color in brown, which is going to be representing the sensation of umami, which is sort of a satisfying, satisfaction, savory sort of a taste. And the tastant in this case is going to be glutamate, and famously, monosodium glutamate, or MSG. Well, let's move on to the olfactory system. The first thing we're going to draw in the olfactory system are simply olfactory neurons themselves, which is a fairly structured um, uh, side by side inside. Basically, in the roof of your nose, you have these cells represented there. They have radiating cilia down at the bottom. I'm going to go ahead and draw four of these guys, and you'll notice they're Nice bipolar cells with that cell body right in the center there. And nice long structures on either side. The sensitive region down below or the dendritic region down below and the axon up above there. And our cell body, of course, with a nucleus in there. All right, so we have these radiating cilia. That's one of the unusual aspects of these cells. They have these radiating cilia, actually quite well organized in the roof of your nose, basically. The next structure I want to draw gives us a little bit of perspective of, of exactly where these are. If you'll recall your bone anatomy, we discussed the ethmoid bone and specifically the cribriform plate of the ethmoid bone. The cribriform plate of the ethmoid bone has structures called olfactory foramina, olfactory foramina, which means that we have holes in this bone that allows basically for these axons to be sent upward through the bone. That's what these holes are specifically for. So you'll see those there. So there we colorized our ethmoid bone in orange. And just above here, just superior to this structure, is cranial nerve 1 or our olfactory bulb, which we actually drew in the brain. It was one of the first things we drew today, off to the side there. So although we're not going into a lot of detail about this, basically the olfactory neurons are going to be receiving cell and then re receiving odorants and then sending the signal up into the olfactory bulb. They're going to synapse, mitrocells, there are um, uh, glomeruli inside of here. We're not going to go into a lot of detail about this because we're kind of focused on the sensation. So for now we'll go ahead and simply send them up into the olfactory bulb and then send the signal on its way. <laughs> um, just inferior to the ethmoid bone we're going to have some connective tissue and then just inferior to that we're going to have a series of supportive cells which I, we're not going to be coloring all the little cells, but these are epithelial cells. We'll just draw it all in gray there. And as we continue to follow these layers down, we should mark off the fact that the olfactory epithelium, including the supportive cells and the olfactory neurons, is basically the structure of smell. It's, a, it's an epithelium, it's a layer that has all of the cells that are responsible for smelling things, the olfactory epithelium. Lastly, the most inferior area of this is actually going to be the mucus. I had stipulated earlier that in order for there to be a sensation of smell, you had to have uh, odorants that are dissolved in mucus. There has to be an aqueous substance here. Now, this is a good time to tell you that one of the unusual aspects of the olfactory neurons is that they are the only neurons in the body that are actually exposed to the outside world. They're buried in this mucus, yes, which gives them a little bit of protection, but the layer is quite thin. So, all of these neurons, they are true neurons. It's not like, for example, the gustatory system where you're using epithelial cells for the purpose of sensation. These are actual neurons that are used to, to sense odorants, but they're exposed to the outside world. 
which means that they are subject to damage and therefore they must be regenerative. <laughs> you can't have non-regenerative cells in such a position. So this is one of the very, very few examples of neurons that are actually regenerative, which makes them quite interesting as far as research interests are concerned. It also means that you need to have some stem cells present to ensure that if there is damage to the adult olfactory neurons, that you have cells right there that are ready to grow up and take the place of these immediately. Um, you can regenerate olfactory neurons over the course of about a month, and so these olfactory stem cells have that purpose. Now we're going to go ahead and draw an odorant. One example of a simple odorant that you would be familiar with would be cinnamon. So if you are smelling something baking in the oven that has cinnamon as part of it, some of those particles of cinnamon, literally chemicals floating through the air, little molecules of, of cinnamon are going to float through the air. Some of them will enter into your nose, and as you see, some of them will be dissolved in the mucus. And one of these cells will be sensitive to cinnamon, and that's actually the entire purpose of this cell, is to be sensitive to cinnamon alone. That's it. You notice the rest of the cells don't get colored, and so they are not actually sensitive to cinnamon. All of the olfactory neurons have their own specific sensitivity. So this is a chemoreceptor. Um, the odorants bind to a receptor on the surface of the olfactory neuron that they match with. And although we're not going into the details of exactly how a G-coupled mechanism or second messenger system works, the idea behind a G-coupled receptor system, and we'll talk about this more down the line when we talk about hormones and the endocrine system, but the idea of a G-coupled receptor system is that the odorants can stay outside of the cell, and even a small number of odorants can cause a great deal of change within the cell. So it's literally three or four molecules of a, uh, an odorant can cause depolarizations inside of the cell. And just in case it wasn't completely clear, the olfactory bulb that we're drawing up above there is the same one that we drew basically in the inferior aspect of the frontal lobe of the brain um, that we drew first thing here. So the olfactory bulb that is receiving all of this information from the olfactory neurons is in fact basically attached to the brain and is technically, technically is actually part of the brain itself.